Right, hello, my name's Chris and I'm the Team North's uh, resident concrete botherer. Today we are at Auburn Sands in East Yorkshire on this fine, sunny Yorkshire summer day. Um, today we've got an amazingly busy beach. There's a lot of tourists around, uh, a lot of people walking their dogs. But 81 years ago, this would have been very, very different. You would be massively unlikely to be able to even access this beach. Uh, following the fall of France, the only thing between uh, Britain and certain invasion was the Channel on the South Coast and also the North Sea. And as a result of this uh, perceived invasion threat, defences such as this one, like this really nice pillbox here just behind me, as well as these anti-tank cubes uh, were constructed en masse across the country to try and defend what was termed the coastal crust. And this was the kind of forward line of anti-invasion defences during the Second World War, which were constructed. Generally, when we look at these defences, what we first see is things like the pillbox, these massive structures which pretty much stand out really nicely in the landscape. Um, but at the time, 81 years ago, there would have been a lot more going on, especially on this stretch of beach. This beach would have been covered extensively with barbed wire, you know, running above the high water mark. In this area, what's really cool is that we sometimes find remnants of this barbed wire, as well as the screw pickets, which are used to kind of fix the barbed wire into, into the ground. These come up uh, fairly frequently during, uh, during our surveys when we're working in this area. But what we don't see is the fact that there was a lot more going on. Um, so there would, would have been slit trenches. We have got some examples of these trenches which were dug in the ground, which soldiers would climb into and scan their surrounding area to defend it if an invader or an invading force did land. Um, we also don't see as well the uh, supporting forces behind these defences as well. So although we have like this nice pillbox and a couple of pillboxes along this stretch of coast, what we don't see is the remains of the actual troops that would have uh, defended this stretch of coast and would have occupied pillboxes like this one. So uh, by August 1940, this stretch of coast uh, was defended by uh, what was termed the 218th Independent Infantry Brigade. And this consisted of a number of divisions, a number of battalions of men who were placed on the coast and inland to defend this, uh, defend this uh, vulnerable stretch of coast. So at, this, uh, at the time in 1940, around August 1940, this uh, stretch of coast would have been in, within the Bridlington sector, the 218 Brigade, and uh, the battalion defending here were responsible for defending uh, all the way from Flamborough over there, all the way along the stretch of coast, down to Balmston, which is just a bit further down the coast here. So that's quite a long uh, stretch of beach to be responsible for, but there were about 800 to 1,000 soldiers responsible for this forward defense. So we've got this amazing pillbox just here. It's another Vickers machine gun pillbox, and we've got a whole range of other things going on here as well. So let's have a, let's have a quick look. So we're just walking through the original path of an anti-tank wall, which is a massive wall built of concrete, which was designed to stop tanks. And, you know, we've got a scatter of this really nasty 1940s concrete going on here. But when we have a closer look at it, we see this metal thing here. So this is the remains of something called um, Admiralty Scaffolding or Z1 Scaffolding. And this was um, a scaffolding obstacle that was originally designed to um, halt the movement of landing craft. It turned out when it was tested, it wasn't very effective at that, but it did produce a really decent uh, anti-tank obstacle. So this stuff was uh, deployed from 19, December 1940 onwards. And on this stretch of coast, we see Z1 uh, been erected all the way from Sperm Point, all the way up to the north end of Scarborough, in the period from February 1941. And surprisingly, you know, at the end of the war, this stuff was scrapped, or supposedly scrapped, but we still find a lot of it eroding out of the beach today. So looking over towards uh, this pillbox, which we call Earwig Villa, because there's a nice bit of uh, graffiti on it, calling it Earwig Villa. And we can see that it's, it's at a bit of a jaunty angle. It wouldn't have been uh, constructed at that angle during the Second World War. So over the past uh, 81 years, we've seen considerable erosion of this boulder clay cliff here, which makes up much of the Holderness coast. So this stuff erodes at about a metre, two metres a year. And this is why coastal erosion is having an adverse effect um, on the defences on this uh, stretch of coast. And you can see over time, you know, this pillbox has started to slump. Originally, it would have been obviously horizontal, pretty much in line with the top of that buttress, which ties it into the anti-tank wall. Um, and over time, you know, it'll eventually, hopefully, level out and flatten out on the beach. But originally it would have been in a slightly elevated position overlooking the anti-tank wall and the beach itself. So let's uh, head down this way and we'll have a 
closer look at this anti-tank wall. So when we have a look at this in a bit more detail, again, we can see it's this really nasty, horrible concrete mix that we see common in 1940. But when we start to get here, we can see, you know, we're seeing this thing to pretty much its original height as it was during the Second World War. Again, really tall, the idea being that this is a nice substantial obstacle which would have impeded the movement of enemy vehicles and would have defended the base of this cliff here. So although this cliff itself would have offered a pretty decent obstacle to an enemy vehicle, the defenders themselves decided to put in this anti-tank wall to further strengthen that as a natural defense. Um, when we look at the uh, fabric of this, we can see these um, vertical lines. And this is the imprints of the wooden shuttering that was used to create a mold into which this was poured. Looking down here, we see some really cool stuff. So you've got the, uh, some original wood actually surviving in place. In fact, we've got some original wooden shuttering there surviving within the fabric of the concrete. Um, so obviously when they were casting these things, um, you know, this wood didn't need to be removed necessarily because, uh, you know, it served its purpose. Though they would try and reuse as much of this wooden shuttering as possible. Within this anti-tank wall as well, we sometimes see wooden stakes uh, which are embedded in this. And we're fairly certain that uh, these wooden stakes indicate the line of the anti-tank wall or the line the wall was meant to take. And this would have been pegged out on the beach and marked out with tape or string. And the engineers would have come in later and constructed the obstacle, um, in this case, an anti-tank wall around those pegs. Okay, right, let's have a look at this side of Earwig Villa. So we've already looked at these pillboxes before and we know that they would have housed a Vickers medium machine gun. When we have a look at uh, the embrasure, which is this hole in the wall, also known as a loophole, uh, through which the gun would have fired, we can see some really cool stuff going on. So we have some uh, um, indicators of how this, uh, how this embrasure was constructed and how the pillbox itself was constructed. Um, mainly that we can see these horizontal lines running across the pillbox's front, which are the imprints left by the wooden shuttering that was used to build the pillbox itself. So shuttering is um, like a big mould made out of uh, wooden planks, and then into that you pour your concrete. Sometimes we find uh, pillboxes built with a facing and an internal facing of brick, which is used again as a shuttering. And a lot of people assume that the pillbox is built from brick when in reality they had a reinforced concrete core. So looking at this embrasure, we can see that we've got these kind of wooden blocks, which are still inset into the stepped embrasure. And this is where the like, uh, wooden box would have fit through the uh, shuttering to create this embrasure. So when they cast the pillbox and start to take the shuttering away, they would remove this like box work and that would leave the uh, finished embrasure. Embrasures were stepped um, so that if any incoming rounds struck the sides, they wouldn't get channeled into the pillbox. So sometimes you find um, embrasures which are flat sided and that quickly funneled uh, incoming projectiles, splinters and shrapnel into the pillbox itself. Um, we also notice this rather large buttress uh, below the embrasure, and this is actually hollow on the inside. So this would have allowed originally the forward legs of the uh, Vickers machine gun bipod or tripod even to um, fit in there. And that would have given a wider arc of fire from this embrasure. So the muzzle of the gun would have been pretty much in line with this outer surface of the pillbox. On the back edge, back to the anti-tank wall again, which is made from this horrible concrete, which I really don't like, we can see these, um, curly bits of metal, which are actually screw pickets. So I mentioned earlier that these were driven into the ground, screwed into the ground and used for holding barbed wire. In this case, they've actually been used as a form of reinforcement for the anti-tank wall, which is really quite cool and something you don't see very often, but it's a nice, nice feature. So coming around to this side of the pillbox, let's have a look here. This is one of a pair of entrances, which sits oddly enough, facing the <laughs> facing towards the expected avenue of enemy approach. So there's one on this side, another one on the inside, on the other side, and then inside it's pretty much an empty structure. But yeah, this projects forward, um, again, towards the expected avenue of en enemy approach. And there's been some debate whether this was a delivery design flaw uh, to try and keep the uh, crew inside inside when they were under fire so that they didn't abandon the position or try to fall back. We simply don't know, it's um, purely conjecture, and we probably won't know the answer until, until we find a document that supports that. Interestingly enough, there was some variance on, or some 
uh, modified versions of this pillbox employed up at Scarborough, which actually had a brick wall built in front of this entrance. In fact, there's one at, uh, there was one at Reeton, which had a hole cut through the back wall. So they were clearly aware of this as a limitation of this design, but it's very, very unclear whether this was deliberate or whether it was just a mistake. And it was a matter of uh, the pillbox design meant to have been in place within a trench system or something like that. We simply don't know uh, at the time being, but that's something I want to get to the bottom of. We'll have a look at some other things as we go along. Again, massive, massive, horrible, really nasty concrete that I really don't like. Uh, but what we see as we go along is this uh, cliff that we're looking at on the right hand side here, or my right, has eroded a significant degree. So originally this anti-tank wall and the defences uh, were pretty much built butting up against the base of that cliff. So over the past 80 years or, eight, or 80 or so years, we've lost easily about 15 metres of, uh, of this coastline in that time, which isn't a lot for this stretch of coast. Some places we get a metre or two metres a year, but it does give us a good indication of how far things have eroded over the last 80 years. So we can actually use Second World War defences as a kind of proxy to uh, measure and understand coastal erosion in a given area, which is a really cool thing. So I mentioned a minute ago, we have these wooden pegs, which are likely to uh, survive from when the anti-tank wall was plotted out on the ground. And that's one of them there. So a simple wooden peg stuck in the ground and they cast the anti-tank wall around it. This is something we uh, see massively on this, uh, on this stretch of coast. You know, you've got another one just in there. And once you get your eye in with these things, you'll be seeing them all over the place. Again, more really horrible anti-tank blocks or anti-tank cubes. These, these examples are almost at their original height. So it gives you a kind of idea of how tall these things are. Quick thing to mention about these, um, the ones you find in Yorkshire are actually bigger than the standardized design. So the standardized design had dimensions of about 1.2 meters square. The ones we get in Yorkshire are much bigger. So anything from 1.6 meters up to 1.9 meters, even two meters with the additional examples, which are even two meters tall as well and two meters square. So that's uh, something to point out. We do things bit bigger and better in Yorkshire. And that brings us to <laughs> this rather interesting structure here. So it might look like a pillbox. Uh, yeah, and I can see why people, why, why people would think this is a pillbox, but it's actually not. This is what was called a beach defense light. So this was a speci specially designed concrete structure with this originally a wide open embrasure which faces, in this case, north. And this is something we find a fair bit on the, uh, on the Yorkshire coast and el elsewhere, is this, this structure which was designed, or <laughs> yeah, um, was intended to be used to, so there would have been a big light, a searchlight in there, which would have been occupied, there'd been a generator in the superstructure to the rear, and this would have been used to illuminate and sweep the beach um, in the event of an invasion at night. In practice, this was a really, really nice idea. You know, you want to be able to see what you want to shoot at on the beach if it lands at night. In reality, it was a really bad idea. As soon as this thing opened up with this massive light, the first thing that enemy troops landing on the beach would do is shoot at the position and make the soldiers inside not very happy. And then you also have the additional issue as well of any supporting uh, ships out to sea being able to use that as a nice marker to pour pour fire onto. So very, very quickly what we see with these uh, is that the embrasure, the really wide, nice, inviting embrasure was filled up with concrete and the position potentially turned into a light machine gun post. There was one example which we see um, that was photographed just to the north end of Bridlington, which was taken in July 1940. And by that time, you know, within a couple of months of the construction, the embrasure was already filled up by that point then. If we come around the back, Again, you can see, you know, it's nice. It's kind of a, like an almost First World War um, searchlight -like upon you on there. And you see very similar positions built as part of our, uh, artillery batteries during the First World War. So it's a really, really, you know, really nice design. It's just not very good. Uh, yeah, and then coming around to the rear, you know, you've got some of the rebar sticking out there. Um, and the original entrance has actually been filled up on this example as well. So that's actually uh, looking like a Second World War concrete mix. So it's probably infilled shortly after construction, even though it was converted to a light machine gun post. And we've also got the blast wall, which has since detached from this, uh, from the rear here. And this would have just been a big thick wall to protect the entrance um, to the uh, beach defense light emplacement as well, and offer a bit more protection to this open entrance and to the uh, troops inside who were likely to get shot at a lot uh, when they operated the uh, light. All right, there's a couple of other really cool things down here as well, if we keep on going.
So believe it or not, the east coast of the country was fortified extensively during the First World War as well. So the first time we pretty much see pillboxes built uh, on the east coast and elsewhere is during the First World War. A lot of people simply don't know this. And uh, a lot of people have seen that, you know, the Navy were protecting the coast during the uh, First World War. There was a massive amount of invasion threats during the First World War. Pretty much as soon as war was declared, there was a fear that the Germans would just arrive in London and, you know, invade. Uh, a lot of these uh, invasion threats kind of coincided with movements on the Western Front as well. So there was uh, a several times where the Germans made a breakthrough and there was a fear that they would keep on going and um, try and invade. So during, throughout the First World War, the East Coast was vulnerable from uh, ports in Belgium um, and even Northern Germany as well. And as a result, extensive anti-invasion defences were built along the East Coast, all the way from Kent, all the way far as far north as Scotland. And these are now forgotten. Um, you know, everyone thinks anti-invasion defence is the Second World War. Not the case. Let's just take a quick, quick look at this one. So there are a couple of good indicators that uh, indicate to us that this is different from the uh, Second World War pillboxes. The main thing is, is this wall thickness. So that's a wall thickness of about 15 centimetres. During the Second World War, uh, there were two standardised pillbox wall thicknesses, which were issued by the War Department to ensure that the pillbox itself was proof against incoming projectiles of different calibres. These were uh, bulletproof, so a wall thickness of reinforced concrete, which is 38 centimetres thick, was uh, bulletproof, and then one metre, six centimetres, obviously these are imperial measurements, was um, shellproof. 15 centimetres is not very thick and doesn't fit to those two specifications. So this wall, um, to Second World War standards, would have been way, way too thin. Um, and it's quite unlikely this would have actually stood up to um, any sustained or prolonged fire. Uh, so that gives a good ind indication this is earlier. We also have as well, um, you know, these things uh, plotted on aerial photographs uh, taken in the interwar period, which gives us a good idea that these things are much earlier. Um, there are several of these along the East Coast. You know, the vast majority of them are now laying on the beach like this, but there are a couple of um, examples which are listed, which surround Auburn Farm. You've got a really nice cluster of First World War pillboxes just down there, which uh, I recommend come and have a visit for yourself. Um, but yeah, due to coastal erosion and, and movement, this example here, sometimes it's fully exposed, sometimes it's completely buried. Uh, when we surveyed it a couple of years back, um, you know, uh, just the side walls here were surviving up to about a height of that. Uh, you've got just about one embrasure surviving there. So these were a simple square pillbox. So these were, things were constructed with a lattice work of, um, of rebar, which was pretty much like diamond shaped. It's really weird. It's like a lattice which creates these diamond shapes. And this is a really nice indicator of a First World War uh, pillbox. And again, this is something to definitely come and visit this site to have a look at more. Like I say, if you head down to Auburn Sands, you'll, um, you'll see some amazing First World War pillboxes alongside the, uh, the much later Second World War stuff as well. So let's have a look at something that we came back today and uh, discovered and learned about uh, quite by surprise uh, recently. So over the last, uh, last couple of years with uh, working with Citizen, we've been you know, out to the stretch of coast for the last what, six, seven, eight years or something like that. Um, and over time we spotted this lump of concrete here. Uh, what's really cool about this one is when we first saw it, all that was surviving or all that was visible on the ground was pretty much about a section about that. Um, give or take. And now we've come back today and this thing has appeared even more complete on the beach. So originally when I looked at this, um, I thought this might be a first world war pillbox. So what we have is this. Well, the flat side of embrasure, a lot of this has disappeared now. Um, and the wall thickness is a really, really, really thick, which wouldn't indicate a Second World War pillbox. So we thought it was a, a new pillbox design that had not been discovered. And uh, we gave it the rather snappy name of the uh, Sherman Clement Colonco Mason pillbox or something, something really catchy like that. Uh, we've come back on site today and I've started looking at this now and we can see this made from this really horrible 1940s concrete. So I'm fairly certain this is one of these uh, machine gun pillboxes, which is in just such a knackered state that it's really been very hard to identify. But there was a couple of really odd things with this one. The main one being that there's no rebar in this. We've got literally not a single sign of rebar, which is usually indicated by a nice like brown staining, which leaches through the concrete itself and indicates that there is uh, reinforcement within the structure. Very little evidence of that. 
Uh, if we come round the back and look at what I think was the, or is the roof slab, we have got some of the staining coming through, but it's a really, really nasty concrete mix, which indicates it's possibly that 1940s concrete. So coming back here today, seeing a bit more of this pillbox makes me uh, reconsider the original interpretation and makes me wonder if this is a uh, one of these Second World War machine gun pillboxes. So this is something we can look at in further detail when we can get uh, the 1940s aerial photographs and try and plot the location of this and see how that matches up with what we see on the aerial photographs. And maybe we'll... Uh, not have found a new type of First World War pillbox. Right, thank you very much for joining us here at uh, Auburn Sands. We've been Team North, I've been Chris, and we hope to see you again on this lovely stretch of coast very soon.